Hello, and thank you for joining this OncLive TV Peer Exchange. This program features expert panel discussions with a focus on the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. My name is Dr. Mark Sosinski, and I'm director of the lung cancer section at the University of Pittsburgh and co-director of the lung cancer program. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Roy Herps, the Ensign Professor of Medicine, Chief of Medical Oncology, and Associate Director for Translational Research at Yale Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Thomas Stinchcomb, Associate Professor for the Thoracic Oncology Program at the UNC Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center on the campus of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Ann So, Associate Professor, Director of the Mesothelioma Program and Director of the Thoracic Chemo Radiation Program at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And Dr. Heather Wakeley, Associate Professor of Medicine, Division of Oncology at Stanford University in Stanford, California. Thank you again for joining us. Let's get started. I think one of the areas of great enthusiasm and excitement is the role of immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it's been fascinating uh, that our colleagues in immunobiology have kind of figured out many of the mechanisms by which tumors may kind of hide from our own immune system. Roy, uh, kind of introduce us to this. Right, so it, you know, we, we really have evolved in, in the treatment of lung cancer that we're now talking about immunotherapy. You know, for years we've talked about vaccines. Uh, many of those showed some signs of benefit, but not, not truly enough to make us excited to move forward. Uh, and perhaps one of the reasons is that the immune checkpoint is, is, being, is uh, playing a role in, in this disease. What do I mean by that? Well, what, what's been learned, and this, these are discoveries that date back to the uh, early 90s, uh, it was found that uh, tumor cells, and lung, lung, lung tumor cells are one of the top on the list, tend to make a protein known as PDL1. And if you have a tumor cell, it makes this PDL1. And what happens is the PDL1 keeps the T cells from attacking that tumor. And uh, the idea is quite simple. In retrospect, you, you block the PDL1 in one of a number of different ways, or you block the receptor on the T cell, and then you allow the, the, uh, the, uh, the tumor to be killed. Now, this has so much potential. Um, and I think it's important that we talk about that, but we also be realistic of our limitations as well. It has the uh, ability to be very specific. What could be better than having your own immune system target the tumor? Uh, we also know that immune responses can be durable. You know, many of us were vaccinated, hopefully all of us were vaccinated when we were young. <laughs> if not, I'm, I'm leaving. But, <laughs> but you know, um, and, and those vaccines actually keep us going for a long time. And then the idea of adaptation is so important. We talked earlier about all the small molecules and the resistance that develops. The hope is that the immune system might uh, might work and, 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 and the, uh, be adaptable as the tumor changes as well. So you know, we're seeing some promise now uh, with these agents. I would tell you from my own personal experience, I haven't seen uh, new therapies work like this since we started working with the EGFR inhibitors and, and then the ALK inhibitors you know, in, in the last 15, 20 years. So clearly there's a benefit. The one thing is not all patients benefit, so there's a lot of room for us uh, 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 doing clinical trials to figure out how to do better. What are the biomarkers? And then, of course, there's a whole unique uh, set of toxicities that we probably should discuss as well, because it's something you have to have on your mind when you see these patients. But I clearly think we're on the, the forefront of, of great advances in this disease. So, uh, Tom, we, at uh, the Chicago ISLAC meeting, we really saw really the first true phase two experience, Checkmate 063, which was in a third plus squamous carcinoma. Can you tell us about that? Sure, we actually participated in that trial at uh, UNC. And on our experience, many of the patients were pretty heavily pretreated because you had to go through two lines of FDA-approved therapy, and this was a third and fourth line squamous patients. And as you said in the beginning, these tend to be older and sicker patients at the time of diagnosis, nonetheless after two lines of therapy. I think the trial did show some activity with an independent radiological review response rate of about 15%. And some of those responses were durable. About eight months was, I think, the median. When I look at the trial data, I think that most impressed me was I think the one-year progression-free survival rate was around 20 percent, and the one-year overall survival rate was around 40 percent, mm -hmm. um, which has not been seen in that patient population. I think as we kind of look at that trial, you're going to see a minority of patients got tremendous benefit, and then a number of patients progressed through. And as Roy talked about, I think we really it's becoming upon us to really d define a biomarker so we can really select patients for this. So, yeah, and so recently we heard, um, you know, um, quickly after the activity was documented in early phase one trials, 
uh, not only were phase two trials planned, but phase three trials were planned. And we had some recent information about this uh, molecule, uh, uh, nivolumab, in that setting. You want to just kind of top line that for us? Sure. There was a phase three trial in the second line setting comparing docetaxel to nivolumab. And we know from the press release it met its uh, primary endpoint of overall survival. But outside of that, we don't know the magnitude of benefit in overall survival or any of the other efficacy data. I think most of us are eagerly waiting to see the full uh, presentation of this data because it does have the potential to be a practice-changing trial. Right. So we're going to come back to biomarkers in a moment, but I wanted to kind of ask Roy um, to talk about there are other agents. Pembrolizumab is uh, one and also a couple of uh, anti-PDL1 agents, and I think these are slightly different, but you want to walk us through those uh, drugs? Right. So. You know, you almost need a scorecard now, Mark. There so many of these. But there are three or four that are most advanced in lung cancer, and we probably should talk about those today. And again, the differentiation would be, um, here's the tumor, here's the T cell. Do they block the, the PD-L1, or do they block the PD-1 receptor on, on, on the T cell? And they, they fall into two different classes. There is some thought that if you block the PD-L1 directly, uh, that could be a little less toxic, because there's another uh, molecule, PD-L2, uh, which is, is involved in normal inflammation, and the hope is that if you block PDL1, you leave PDL2 uh, uh, intact. That, that remains to be seen as, as there are more randomized trials. So the other, the other agents in, in this field, there's another PD1 that's quite advanced um, from Merck, Merck 3475 or Pembrolizumab. And uh, this agent's already approved in melanoma. You can go get it at your pharmacy. Probably some of our colleagues or those of us that do melanoma have used it. Uh, it's another a antibody, uh, different antibody. Antibodies are all different, different epitopes, different, different, uh, different affinities, but it also works against PD-1. Um, it's interesting, the phase one trial uh, probably is close to 1,000 patients now accrued, so, and we, many of us have been involved with that. These large phase one trials, you know, uh, many of the patients, lung cancer, and from that phase one trial, we've, we've heard from presentations at ASCO and ESMO that response rates are upwards of 20%. And then we've been intrigued that with a biomarker development, that response rate could perhaps get as high as 35% if 50% or more of the uh, cells in a tumor uh, are, are, are labeling for pd one So that's the high biomarker. So that's very interesting. There's a phase three trial in lung cancer, very similar to the one, Tom, that you mentioned with nivolumab of um, uh, the pembrolizumab, the MK3475 versus docetaxel. Interestingly, with two different schedules of, of, of the, the, the pembrolizumab, that's currently accruing. It's, as you can imagine, it's accruing quite quickly right now, given all the interest in this field. So that'll be very interesting to follow. And then, of course, there are the agents that target PD-L1. And uh, there are two main agents, although there are many others coming down the pike. One is called MPDL3280. It doesn't have a name yet. Um, and, and that's a, a Genentech Roche antibody. Actually, uh, several of us have worked on that. We, we worked on it a great deal. We actually published it uh, uh, last November. And this, this really has activity in lung cancer, melanoma, renal cancer. But then basically in almost every cancer we've looked at, there's been activity, including bladder cancer. And it's very interesting that here uh, trials that initially focused on lung cancer have now led to a really great breakthrough in bladder cancer. And part of the reason is we think that it's because mutated cancers, you know, and bladder cancer is also a smoking-related cancer, as is lung, the large number of mutations, you have a better chance of having one of the mutations that's going to drive this immune response. So this drug actually, uh, again, 20% response rate uh, or so in, in unselected patients. With our biomarker development, we could get it up to as high as 60 or more percent, but then again, you're, you're siphoning off a fewer uh, number of patients. But this agent's now in phase three trials, both in frontline and refractory settings of lung cancer, trials looking at brain metastases and other areas. So that's moving forward. And then the uh, other agent uh, is uh, Medi4736, a drug for Metamune AstraZeneca, also a pdl one agent. Uh, biomarker development there is, is less well-defined. Um, again, activity in, in, in unselected patients around 20%, leaving us much room to, to work. And there's been a big push now with, with that group to take their two drugs. They have a drug called tremolumumab, which targets CTLA-4, which perhaps works on the T cells a little bit earlier in development in the lymph node, plus their their drug 4736, and that combo, there's been some early data, uh, Scott Antonio presented it at, as, uh, at ESMO, just a poster of 15, 20 patients, but the suggestion that there might be some activity in the PDL one negative patients, and those trials are ongoing. So it's a very fertile field uh, for drug development. So a number of the other agents you mentioned, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, are also in early trials uh, with, this, for instance, ipilimumab. Mm -hmm. They are, and, and you know, a lot of that's based on the work from uh, Mario Snow, my colleague at Yale, and Jed Walchuk from Memorial, 
uh, the data they published uh, in, in melanoma, in patients with metastatic melanoma, where there were 70 percent or more response rates, uh, durable responses, improved survival. So that's being translated to lung cancer. I'll tell you, having taken care of a few patients both with both combinations, you need to be a little more careful with lung cancer patients. I think uh, the lung patients are a little bit sicker. Uh, there's more concerns about neuromonitis, uh, some of the endocrinopathies and other uh, problems that you might see with these combinations. We have to be tuned into that as we start combining these two drugs together. Um, I don't know how much.